Well, good morning and welcome everyone. Namaskar. And uh, uh, today we've all uh, gathered here on this webinar for the Global Privacy and Data Protection Leadership Meet 2022. Uh, this is brought to you by Asuchime India. Now, uh, we hope that all of you are keeping safe and well um, because it's the pandemic is still on. We hope uh, that you're all well and we uh, request you to kindly continue to uh, follow COVID appropriate behavior and uh, ensure that you wear your masks at all times when you're out in the public, when you're out uh, in the open. Um, to begin with today's program, uh, the Global Privacy and Data Protection Leadership Meet 2022 uh, is being organized with an aim to bring all the data privacy leaders together and create an intensive policy debate. Uh, we also hope to have a lively discussion uh, on the ever emerging privacy and data protection trends and challenges uh, in our industry today. Now, the leadership meet uh, will focus on the latest trends in data protection, on privacy engineering, privacy by design, as well as the use of cookies, tracking technologies. Uh, we'll be talking about artificial intelligence and how uh, they change the way organizations collect and process data in the country in today's times. So these are all the topics that we'll be in fact covering through the day uh, on our webinar. To begin our, our today's program, uh, uh, this is a plenary session. We'll also start the inaugural uh, wherein we are, in fact, expecting the Honorable Minister of State for Skill Development and Entrepreneurship. Uh, he's also the Minister for uh, Electronics and Information, uh, Mr. Rajiv Chandrasekhar. So uh, we will be uh, having him during the inaugural. For the plenary session at the moment, uh, we would like to start uh, with uh, a keynote uh, by Sri Deepankar Sanvalka. He's the President, Enterprise Functions with. PTM. So without wasting any time, uh, over to you, Mrs. Anwalka, for your uh, session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samriddhi. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Asu Chayam, for organizing this very topical uh, seminar. Uh, you know, always in every element, every aspect, what we focus on today, data privacy is part of our conversations. Whether we are aware of it or not, it is right at the heart of everything what we do. When we use a smartphone, when we use our computers on anything, we are sharing data. And we are sometimes sharing personal data. People do it and then wonder when they get something back. Some people are appreciative about um, ads which are very related to conversations which they've had some time back and they wonder how the hell did someone get that now the questions on data privacy arise from perceptional issues or actual issues like that and this thing is going to become bigger and bigger as we go along why well, the number of connected devices are just going to increase and increase. We are going to be about 22 billion or 25 billion devices by end of this year, or we already there, I don't know, but just imagine the number of devices which are there. Of course, the increasing data is, is now measured in zettabytes. I, you know, I don't even know what it will be, and many of us do not know, but it is a massive, massive number. 15 years back, I used to be talking in gig, gigabytes and metabytes and stuff and now zettabytes. But it is also important that this data, which is this new oil, we call it, has mushroomed a number of business models, has created immense customer delight, has made life so much easy that this very same phone has become our inseparable device. It has to go along everywhere with us because everything what we do, a lot of that is, or most of it is on this phone, whether it's office work, whether it's personal work, so on and so forth. And related to that, obviously, then issues come around privacy, but also on cyber threats, because where there is um, uh, data which is valuable, where there is money, I can tell you from personal experiences, there will be fraud, there will be theft all these things, so cyber threats are there. They will be phishing, they will be ransom demands which will come up. So obviously all these things has the time is right for us to have continued conversations around this. And I'm very delighted to see that the government is taking such an interest and, and in the space. So, so for for uh, let's let's really and I know there are sessions around the PDP bill. There are sessions around localization. There are sessions around uh, and, uh, around how 
how data fiduciary duties, etc., which are. But I would like to just focus on a couple of points. One is just like my personal uh, professional expertise is in risk. So where are those risks which are there? Firstly, it's financial risk. Very simply, both for the organization who is not able to protect the data in line with the regulations which are there existing already or may come in the future. And those financial penalties are getting heavier and heavier. There is the issue around customer defection slash customer trust. If we know, come to know about a financial institution where personal data has got leaked, and if we are one of those individuals whose data has got compromised, a lot of us will think about moving from that application, from that organization to another one where we believe data privacy and security is very high up on the agenda. And this is, happens every now and then. So clearly, trust is an extremely important part. The third, of course, is around related to this could be reputation. Fourth could be around the data record. So, uh, so, so, so the data records, and lastly, is technology. Technology, how are you going to use that? I work for a company which is really a digitally native, digital native company. We understand and appreciate the value of data. Trust me, we do that. But equally, we are very sensitive about privacy, about information security, because we know that that is the cornerstone for the trust which we create with our user community, with our merchant community, with our banking partners, so and so forth. So what I would like to really uh, dive into, uh, you know, there are three parts. One, I talk about the PDP Act and how it's come about. And I think so there are some very, very good recommendations. There are some conversations already around saying that, okay, no, perhaps we need to revise it further, which is, which is again a good thing, really, because this is such a dynamic situation. So my two bits on something like that is first and foremost, let's can we really define very clearly so everyone on the same page what is sensitive personal data right because once we have that we all know that okay yeah, it could be my personal data could be my passport number could be my aadhaar number could be uh, could be my medical records all these are personal data but what all constitutes what else constitutes sensitive personal data i think so it's very important to very clearly define that because that to my mind requires the highest level of security and sensitivity the second part related to that is how are we um, what shall i say um, uh, securing this data and where are we securing this data so you know when we know that when data gets secured in a particular country today there is a very very high possibility and probability that that host countries regulatory agencies will get access to data now if it is india data why should we be having access on that and we'll talk a bit more about that later um, the second point is really around encryption so we know data gets encrypted we know our banking transactions get encrypted when they go from one end to the other end all excellent stuff but this technology requires an encryption and a decryption key that again perhaps needs to be defined as to where that should be there which where that should be situated if that is not situated in your country then frankly you all have a scrambled data sitting in your country which you can't do anything with it so it's these are small little things but very important from a uh, from a practical point of view. The third one, of course, is non-personal data. You know, that's, again, a lot of power in that, and there is recommendations by METI, uh, which have been given recently around that whole space, around that how is it applicable, how can it be shared, what, how can you use that? I think so these are all very important points, and that's fantastic, right? The fifth around data portability, and lastly, it's very important around governance 
and the whole idea of data protection authority. I personally am a big advocate and proponent of having a data protection authority. This will be the big thing tomorrow and it's already is today. So we have to have an independent authority which handles this whole space as part of the uh, central government ecosystem. I, I just wanted to spend some time more, you know, last uh, four or five minutes around localization. Why do we need, what's the debate around localization and why should we have localization of data? Again, from my personal perspective and our perspective, I think so, India data should reside in India. Firstly, it's about the security of our India's economic infrastructure and our payment systems. If the data resides in some other country, that access we should expect will be there to the regulatory agencies from there. Why should they have that? It's our data, it's my data. It should remain in India. The second point is around the data misuse. If the data resides in the country, one can then regulate who will get access to it. When it is not in your country or it's available to third parties. And we have seen that when data gets available to third parties, whichever mechanism it may be, how it can be used to influence behaviors. And the biggest example was the Cambridge Analytica affair. One doesn't need to go beyond that to see how today there is so much of personal data, whatever you do when you buy something on an e-commerce site, when you do a financial, all that is getting captured by various people. So if that data is available to third parties, it is liable to misuse and that is a very big risk. And that again needs to be controlled in a very proactive manner. The third one, of course, related to the first example, the first point I made is around the supervisory access for law enforcement, right? If the data is here, we get far better access to that. I understand there have been cases, we all know that, where organizations have refused to share data or provide data when the government has asked for it. Because, and because A, a lot of time also because it's not residing in India. There are arguments which are given around localization that you know there's cost. I don't believe that the cost of data localization is not much at all. It's minuscule compared to what the impact it creates on us. And anyways, most of this data, 95 to 96% of this data which you're talking about is all within India, within Indian citizens, government. So why shouldn't it be remaining here? The, and by the way, we are not unique in this journey. Most of the countries or a number of countries have already implemented laws around data localization. So, 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 so we should be considering that too for, for our country going forward. And I hope as the debate goes on today, there is some discussion around this issue. I would love to understand and hear different perspectives which are there because this is again, the more we debate, more we have conversations on, I think so we get to the right and the best solution which is there. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to address you all. I really look forward to the deliberations today and thank you once again, Asuchem, uh, for organizing this uh, seminar. All the very best to you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dipankar, for talking to all of us and sharing with us your perspective. And uh, it is time for me to now invite uh, Mr. Terence Gomes, Enterprise Security Executive India at Enterprise uh, uh, Security, uh, Cybersecurity Group, Microsoft India, to share his thoughts on global privacy and data uh, protection. Over to you. And um, thank you uh, to the Asocham team for having me here. Uh, it's an honor to be presenting and sharing my views uh, with the esteemed audience here. In the next 15 minutes, uh, I'm going to be covering uh, what are we hearing, uh, you know, based on our interactions with the organizations in India uh, across different sectors, uh, their needs uh, when it comes to data security, uh, compliance and privacy, and how are we working with them to, you know, ensure these needs are met uh, proactively. So with that, let me get started. 
the first point and I, uh, uh, the first slide that I wanted to actually bring up for the discussion and, uh, and deliberation is what is the top of mind for organizations in India that we're hearing. Uh, and as we embrace uh, the di rapid digital transformation that is happening uh, across us, uh, you know, at and 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 different uh, sectors, departments, uh, and and scenarios, whether it's consumers, citizenships, uh, citizen data, or 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 e uh, commerce, uh, data security continues to remain. Uh, top of mind and top of challenge, and uh, these are some of the things that uh, you know that our uh, organizations and our users are dealing with. Right, uh, the data is growing. Uh, you know, data is uh, flowing rapidly. Uh, we've seen <clears throat> usage of data across uh, you know different applications, different environments, and it's no longer sitting uh, locally on our servers within our data center. So as we embrace the new normal. Uh, you know what happens to the data and how it is getting used and and you know what data who has access to that data it continues to be a challenge the other thing that organizations are uh, you know wanting to know about is uh, is also all these points right where does my data data reside when i'm uh, you know when i'm uh, subscribing to the certain services uh, certain applications, certain uh, ways of, uh, you know, working and interacting externally and internally. Uh, where does my data reside? Where, uh, who has access to my data? Uh, what secure, what data security uh, principles and, and controls have been put in place? Also from a uh, perspective about, uh, you know, whether I, to in terms of the liability of the data, like how long do I need to retain this data? So these are some of the points that I, you know, I put up on the screen uh, for our audience. And these are some of the concerns that we're constantly hearing that I'm going to talk about saying, how do we address this and, and how do we kind of proactively plan for this, right? And then now also with, uh, you know, with the talks around the data protection. So these are some of the questions that we are, you know, constantly getting and hearing uh, from organizations, right? Like. Uh, what data do I have? Where does my data reside? Who has access to my data? Is it being shared or 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 being used without my knowledge for any other purpose than what I have been you know, I have assigned for? And how do I know what is happening to my data? Whether it's being used by my uh, by by third party service providers? Uh, where you know, what happens to the data when it is externally shared? Or what happens to the data when it is being worked upon remotely? Right. And finally. Uh, if I want to discontinue a specific service or, or sign off from a specific service provider, how do I know that that data doesn't, you know, is there is no copies or it is not residing uh, or whatever data had to be taken out? So these are a lot of questions that we're getting from organizations uh, as, you know, as this conversation around the whole about, uh, you know, my data needs to be my data. Uh, if I need to subscribe to a certain service, it's only for that purpose and and you know and should be secure and compliant through the law of the land so these are the these are the top of mind things uh, that definitely get discussed and we pro we work with our clients to actually bring this up for discussion and 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 share with them about you know how to address these proactively so um, you know in my next 5 10 minutes i'm going to be talking about how are we working with organizations in india to deal with these challenges around data security privacy uh, compliance and and overall handling of data right now at microsoft the way we uh, let me just bring up my slide here at microsoft firstly i just wanted to point out right and this is a leadership commitment uh, around these top four principles when it comes to dealing with data uh, data privacy data security data compliance and data residency right and this is you know this is the tone uh, that the organization carries right from the top and in each of these areas when we are working with clients we want we proactively bring this up for discussion uh, to make sure to give them the assurance uh, you know that these are the four areas that our foundation to our uh, principle of working and doing business uh, in, in each and every geography, including India. The first one, you know, I just want to kind of highlight and starting with privacy. Uh, privacy, of course, is something, uh, you know, that we take seriously and have embedded this in the design of the technology. And again, your data is your data. Uh, we don't use the data for any data mining, advertising purposes. It's you know it's predominantly meant for the services that our organizations use, and and you know bringing this up again to the concerns that were raised uh, by clients on the earlier slide, saying what are the what are the controls that a service provider or you know would take or should be taking to making sure that 
the data is is you know continues to stay private and only accessible to the to the clients and not uh, otherwise and at microsoft uh, again as a service provider we strongly committed we you know there are different controls and different uh, approaches we take like data is always encrypted whether it's at rest or whether it is in, uh, in transit uh, engineers uh, administrators do not have any standing access or no no access to the data and it's only being used for uh, rendering services like we call it a lockbox functionality which is just in time uh, and just uh, you know just enough access to deliver on the support related services and we follow very stringent guidelines uh, right from physical security to to application security and everything in between uh, from a privacy standpoint from a security standpoint uh, you know again following the defense in depth multi-layered security approach to make sure that uh, the data and the services that are rendered uh, as a service provider to our customers follow very stringent and, and secure frameworks. And what I am talking about is what Microsoft does as a service provider. On top of that, there are additional controls that organization that we enable organizations would want to go and add on top of the you know what the service provider like Microsoft is doing. To give you an example, uh, you know, bring your own encryption or bring you know BYOK as we normally call it is one of the features that we allow and we and we also encourage our customers to use when they want to put data on the on cloud platforms like Microsoft, whether it is Office 365 or Azure. So from a data security standpoint, uh, we follow strong security practices across all layers, uh, continuous monitoring and testing uh, done by more than 3,500 odd security experts at Microsoft to make sure that the data security is, is maintained and constantly uh, you know, uh, delivered in terms of SLAs, but at the same time, even it provide customers with additional controls like you know multi-factor authentication, network micro segmentation, work pro uh, level protection to make sure that their data uh, you know is safe and secure on a service on a cloud provide platform like Microsoft. Apart from that, in terms of commitments to dealing with various uh, regulations, laws, and and you know a strong emphasis. Um, you know, to the to the requirements in India, we are committed, and we and you know, and that's a that's a commitment, that's a promise that Microsoft takes very seriously to the heart in India to comply with the law of the land and the regulatory requirements here. Uh, I've just highlighted two, uh, you know, the Meti guidelines, and and Microsoft's cloud platform is empaneled with Meti, but at the same time, also especially in the financial sector, whether it is the RBI requirement, whether it's the IRDA requirement or the SEBI practices, right? The, as a cloud provider, there's, con there's a constant endeavor to, to keep up to date on all these requirements and make sure that our customers uh, and are, are not only secure, but also compliant with, when they use a platform uh, like Microsoft. And then to the fourth point in terms of uh, you know, data residency requirements, right? Uh, and this is again, uh, you know, taking cue from our, our previous speaker, keynote speaker, who mentioned about the requirement of keeping data local and within the country, uh, you know, and, and following the law of the land. Again, we're committed there as a service provider. And while we have a very global footprint to deliver on those uh, requirements, even in India, uh, from a data residency, data localization standpoint, we are committed and provide options to our uh, you know our subscribers and our clients to keep their data locally uh, you know within the geographical boundaries uh, of india so on delivering on those promises in terms of uh, privacy by design security you know by default uh, complying with the regulatory requirements uh, of india and also the data residency and localization requirements of india we take that uh, you know we work on that proactively and constantly endeavor to meet those requirements uh, you know, in uh, you know, in the true spirit of uh, you know, uh, public-private partnership, I would say. But at the same time, right? While these are done by you know, uh, while we do all of these activities to meet the concerns that our clients have uh, related to data security and privacy, uh, there are also additional tools and and controls that we uh, provide to customers who would like to do this uh, on their own as well, right? And these are the top four constant, I would say practices that uh, we've seen clients want to do like they want to know uh, where their data lies they want to be able to protect their data they want to be able to implement controls to prevent any data uh, leakage or access to that data and finally they would like to govern the data 
uh, end to end right from the stage of creation uh, to storage uh, to archival and deletion right so even from a from a customer standpoint you know, we help them with all these different uh, levers in, ter in terms of ensuring data security and data governance end to end and uh, you know in order to do that of course there are underlying platforms and, and solutions uh, that Microsoft has the, the, the most recent one that Microsoft announced is the privacy management uh, solution and the tool which helps customers identify uh, what PII data you know is being shared uh, is it protected or not protected is it leaving uh, any specific geographical location or not and give you more visibility around you know uh, detecting PII data personal data non-personal data and proactively implementing measures in, in in place to do that so just sharing some of those right so I think in if I have to kind of summarize uh, you know as a as a service provider and uh, you know as a platform provider uh, on our uh, I would say <clears throat> uh, promise to customers and organizations in India we understand the concerns uh, and, and take this very seriously. There are security, privacy, and compliance definitely uh, is something that you know is top priority for us. We design our cloud services to you know based on these core requirements to make sure that these are embedded as part of the platform, and we are continuously updating uh, and then keeping ourselves up to date on the local requirements uh, and also keeping you know uh, the India Data Protection Bill in mind actively working to make sure that whenever the bill becomes law you know we are ready for uh, you know for our customers and our subscribers in India so uh, that is what I had uh, to you know as an update today to cover in terms of what we are hearing as concerns but at the same time what is Microsoft doing to enable organizations in India uh, to address those concerns around data security privacy and compliance uh, thank you so much for your time and attention. I'll hand it over back uh, to the organizing team. Thank you, Terence, for sharing with us that uh, very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation and talking to us uh, all about global privacy and data protection and Microsoft's commitments uh, towards the same. And now it's time for me to invite Mr. Sunil Abraham. He's the Public Policy Director at Meta India to now share his perspective uh, and talk to all of us. Over to you. Thanks uh, so much, uh, Samriddhi, and uh, thanks to Asocham and all the organizers of this event uh, for giving me an opportunity to share uh, with the audience Meta's perspective on privacy and data protection. Uh, in the 15 minutes that I have, I'm hoping to first introduce all of you uh, to Meta's privacy-focused vision. Uh, this is core to the way we build and deploy our technologies. And uh, secondly, I would like to uh, sort of react to various discussions and discourse around the data protection bill in India and give Meta's perspective on that uh, debate that is still going on. Uh, so to begin with, uh, what is Meta's vision when it comes uh, to privacy and data protection? Uh, I think everybody will agree with us, uh, with me and with Meta when I say, that if our users don't trust us with their data, we won't have any users. Uh, it is only because uh, the right to privacy is comprehensively protected across our products uh, that users uh, love our products and continue to use our products. And it is not just the right uh, to privacy that is protected on our platforms. Uh, a range of other human rights are also enabled and protected, uh, including uh, the right to free speech and expression. Uh, in contrast, perhaps, with uh, technology providers who give paid services to their users, all our services are free. And that perhaps explains the large number of users, especially in countries like India, who use our services on a daily basis. So uh, what makes, then the question to ask is, uh, what makes it possible uh, for us to provide gratis or free of cost services to such a large user base? And this is possible because of the personalized advertising model which exists across the internet. Uh, and uh, what is what happens is, uh, because the users trust us with their data, 
advertisers, both big and small, are able to use uh, our platform to deliver ads uh, that are in line with the preferences of the users. And uh, the user gets access uh, to a free and sophisticated global service. And at the same time, the advertisers are able to reach uh, the audiences with their products and their services. So that is really uh, foundational to the way uh, we work. Uh, we have to have trust on both sides, uh, the trust of the user and the trust of the advertisers. Uh, but this is, uh, can be quite a challenge because privacy expectations keep changing and privacy expectations are also very different across different populations and groups of people. Uh, within the same population, privacy expectations and preferences might change as they age, as uh, a young person becomes older, becomes middle-aged, uh, they might have very different uh, preferences. Silver Surface, aged users of our platforms, again, have very different expectations uh, around what they consider private information and what they would like to share uh, within their family group or with a larger community or even with the general uh, public. So the wonderful thing that a family of apps from Meta can provide is specific apps that address your specific needs. So if as a user, you want complete privacy and security and you don't want Meta to know what you're doing, then you would use WhatsApp, uh, which is a, a messaging platform with end-to-end -end, uh, encryption built in. Uh, but on the other hand, if you want to share uh, photographs, videos, uh, some of your creative work, uh, either in a semi-public fashion or in a public fashion, then you would use Facebook and Instagram to express yourself and to more fully realize your potential as a creator and an entrepreneur. Uh, so this is really why uh, we take a design-driven approach which puts uh, the preferences of our users at the heart of the design and architecture of our technology. Uh, users on our platforms use tools such as manage activity, off Facebook activity, and privacy checkup to constantly configure and change their preferred uh, privacy expectations on the platform and to best use the various features uh, on the platform. And uh, in keeping with the changing expectations that our users have, we have already begun to expand end-to-end uh, -end encryption across the family of apps. So, so today, uh, whether it is Facebook Messenger or Instagram Direct, uh, you can opt for end-to-end -end encrypted messaging, even on an app where end-to-end -end, uh, encrypted messaging or content is not the default. And we have also introduced other features like ephemeral content, where the content disappears from Facebook and Instagram, uh, especially when uh, users don't want such content to be part of the public record permanently. Uh, our business and our architecture and our products uh, are constantly evolving, uh, uh, of course, because across the world, uh, privacy regulation uh, evolves uh, just as it is happening in India. And we are very much a responsible participant in those uh, conversations. We are constantly in touch with academics. Uh, there is a lot of academic research that is supported uh, by uh, Meta. Uh, we do uh, listen very carefully to what policymakers say and a variety of other stakeholders as they go about developing uh, in a multi-stakeholder fashion uh, various privacy rules and regulations. And because of this changing landscape of regulations, and also, more importantly, the changing expectations that our users have of us when it comes to privacy protections, our job in Meta is never finished when it comes to privacy. Uh, we are working on it daily and constantly, and the, uh, the task list only grows 
as there are more and more expectations of us as a platform, both from users and from regulators. And we take those expectations very seriously and do a, uh, our very best to deliver on those expectations. Now, I'd like to segue to the second area that I said I would address. Uh, what is required uh, in a data regulation, uh, especially in the regulation that India is currently considering, uh, the most important objective, in our view, is that a regulation, a comprehensive data protection regulation, should provide for greater regulatory uncertainty, so, sorry, certainty, so that uh, regulated entities have a clear path uh, to compliance and are completely sure that once they have invested efforts, that they are indeed in compliance with the regulation. Any regulation which has underspecified definitions or uh, heavily underspecified provisions uh, does not really uh, create the regulatory certainty that is necessary. Uh, you could potentially argue that it might even contribute to regulatory uncertainty. So uh, while it is indeed important uh, to delegate some of the regulations to subsidiary rules uh, and so on, uh, as far as possible, uh, the uh, law itself must provide for maximum regulatory certainty. Uh, the, the next uh, uh, requirement in our view is that when re regulatory certainty is provided, uh, then it does uh, two things, which is it uh, eases, uh, it makes it easier for firms to do business in India, and it also reduces uh, the cost uh, of doing business in India because uh, regulated entities will be very sure of what investments are necessary, uh, technical or otherwise, in order to uh, build compliance uh, with Indian law across uh, their products and technologies. Uh, and uh, one important, perhaps guiding principle here, which would inform the rest of the arguments I'd like to make, is that it is important uh, as we are building uh, a global information society for the rules and regulations in India, uh, while of course addressing some of the particular requirements of Indian citizens, also be interoperable and consistent with uh, the emerging global standard around uh, data protection. And here are some of the key elements of that global standard that is emerging. The first is uh, the protection of the principle of free flow of information. Uh, Cross-border data flows uh, should be promoted, uh, and ideally this should be done using a system of legal certifications. This is critical, uh, especially when uh, firms like us are building a global infrastructure where users across the world are able to communicate and work and build uh, with one another. Uh, I have already repeated, said this, which is uh, it should not add to regulatory uh, uh, uncertainty. And here I'd like to call out uh, the isolated provisions around non-personal data. Uh, these isolated provisions uh, perhaps and could be argued would undermine uh, the security and privacy of users and perhaps conflict with the data minimization principle that has been uh, so uh, well articulated in the draft bill. Uh, third, the uh, regulation should enable and empower children to access the internet and use, as I've said before, uh, gratis or free of cost digital services. We continue to have a huge digital divide uh, and it is important uh, for us all, all of us in the ecosystem to contribute to the bridging of this digital divide by ensuring that there is maximum access to all children, uh, reg regardless of their gender and economic status. Uh, the uh, next point that I'd like to focus on is the regulator. Uh, it is important, I believe, especially when it comes to realizing the vision of privacy by design in the draft bill for us to have 
a technically knowledgeable regulator who could engage uh, the regulated entities on a variety of standards uh, related discussions which could help us build more predictable compliance uh, across uh, the sector and finally uh, the last point that i would like to end with is that it is important for the regulation to give an adequate uh, compliance runway uh, for companies uh, especially for uh, global and complex platforms if there isn't uh, sufficient time provided for thoughtful and rigorous uh, compliance uh, with the indian law uh, uh, the safety and uh, security imperatives uh, that are so important for all of us could be potentially undermined. Uh, those are some of our reflections when it comes uh, to the upcoming data protection law in India. Uh, as I've said before, uh, privacy is a foundational uh, component of our business model and our technological platforms. and. Uh, Abiding with privacy laws is something that we take very, very seriously at, at Meta. Uh, I'd like to end by thanking everybody as, at Asocham for giving me this opportunity to share our perspective with you. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Sunil Abraham, for uh, talking to all of us. And uh, uh, with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for all of our, uh, uh, our panelists, our speakers, and the audiences who've joined us on this uh, webinar, uh, we come to a close of the plenary session. Mr. Dipankar Sanvalka, uh, Mr. Terence uh, Gomez, and uh, Mrs. Sunil Abraham spoke to us uh, during this session. And now we'll begin uh, with the inaugural session in about uh, 15 minutes from now and uh, take a, a short break here and uh, be back at 11.30. Like I said in the inaugural session, we are expecting uh, Mr. Rajiv Chandrasekhar. He's the Honorable Minister of State for Skill Development and Entrepreneurship and Electronics and Information Technology. So he will be uh, talking to us. He's the chief guest uh, at our today's webinar and will be speaking to us during the inaugural session. Uh, please join us in 15 minutes. And uh, that's when we are going to start with the inaugural. Thank you. <laughs>